Paul Morphy's strategy in this game seems pretty simple. Always attack something. In this entire game, it just seems almost every single move, Paul Morphy is threatening to take something from his opponent, Adolf Anderson, some sort of tactic. And after a while, that adds up. It is very hard to defend forever. There is a real clear strategy to what Morphy is doing, finding that weakest spot, threatening to capture it. So let's jump right in. This was played in the famous Paris match that Morphy had with Adolf Anderson. Morphy has white, Anderson has black. This was in 1858. Let us begin. Morphy plays e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, and bishop to b5, the Spanish opening, of course, very popular even these days. And here Anderson plays knight f6, or the Berlin defense. Now, there was a many, many decades where this was not popular, but then Kromnik brought it back at around the turn of this previous century, around the year 2000. And this is played at the highest level this very day. Um, castling is the main move here, and we get this position, which is uh, known as the Berlin endgame, a very sharp, well, very complex anyway, and strategic endgame. But Morphy plays much more directly. We know Morphy tried to open up the center whenever possible. So he plays his first threat of the game, d4, threatening, of course, to capture on e5. And um, he's already wanting to put pressure on black. The most common response these days, even played by Carlson, is ed4. After uh, e5, knight e4, knight c5, um, black is doing okay. But Anderson takes with the knight, which is also perfectly fine. Knight takes d4, pawn takes d4, and then e5. Another threat, threatening to take the knight on f6. One thing I've always wondered about Paul Morphy is, uh, where did he get the training for tactics? You know, we can go online to chess.com or Lee Chess and just go through hundreds and hundreds of tactics. I don't know where Morphy got his training from. Maybe it was just from God, but uh, he was amazing. And here we see his continued strategy, always attacking something. In this case, the knight. Anderson counterattacks actually with c6. He could play knight to d5. This is playable. It doesn't score well, but uh, black can survive this after queen d4, c6, bishop c4, knight to b6, when the bishop moves back, d5. And that's uh, pretty much uh, an, an equal position. If instead uh, Morphy had castled, then c6, bishop c4, knight b6. And again, you get uh, a, a fairly equal position. Uh, but instead, Anderson counterattacks the bishop at b5. Um, if you played the bishop to c4, Black would actually be winning after queen to a5 check, and then he picks up the e-pawn and is just uh, much better. Um, if instead queen to d4, knight, b knight to d5, we get the same kind of position, and you play d5, and this is sort of an equalizing concept for Black. So Morphy instead went ahead and castled, and he leaves his own bishop hanging and keeps the threat on that knight at f6. And here Anderson goes ahead and takes the bishop at b5. Now there's a, a little bit of a tricky idea here from Anderson. Um, it would be a mistake for Morphy to go ahead and take that knight. After queen takes f6, um, black seems to be a, a little bit better. He's up two pawns. Um, after, say, rook to e1 check, you could block with the bishop. Knight d2 castle, knight f3. But white is threatening bishop g5 and the knight uh, threatens the pawn at d4. But just bishop c5, and after bishop g5, when the dark square bishops come off, the d4 pawn is won. But then after bishop to b7, already threatening mate on g2, black does look to be a, a bit better with the much superior minor piece um, at b7. So instead, Morphy plays the much stronger move, and the only move for white to keep the advantage, bishop to g5, keeping pressure on that knight. And now the queen will not be able to recapture on f6. That's sort of the idea with bishop to g5. So bishop to e7 must be played. He takes on f6. Um, black hat obviously has to take back with the bishop. And then rook to e1 check. Just threat after threat after threat. Uh, king to f8 is forced, obviously. You could only play the bishop back, then bishop would take bishop. You have to play king to f8 in this position. Bishop takes bishop, again, threatening the queen, although it's obviously a recapture. Uh, and here, Morphy could have played rook to e4, piling up on uh, the d-pawn, but instead he plays c3, another threat, threatening to just take on d4 with the pawn. And in this case, black needs to allow that, because if he takes on c3, 
After knight takes c3, Morphe would be crushing black. I mean, that knight's coming into d5 where it hits the queen. This rook is... All of <laughs> these back rank pieces for black are completely undeveloped. Uh, that would be just a crush. So he has to let Morphe go ahead and take on uh, d5. So black... Excuse me, d4. So black plays d5, then pawn takes. And now black is up a pawn. Um, but Morphe has the better knight. Or the knight is better, I should say, than, than black's bishop, because this pawn at d5 severely limits that bishop. But more importantly is black's king. Anderson's king blocks in this rook on h8, and Morphe has what he loves the most, which is a big lead in development. Uh, so Anderson begins with bishop to e6 to defend the pawn at d5, but now knight to c3, directly attacking another direct threat against uh, the pawn at b5. Uh, a6 to defend that pawn. And now, again, the threats just keep coming. Rook to e5. He sees that the d5 pawn is the weakest point in black's position, so he aims all of his forces at it, every single piece attacking that weak spot. Uh, rook to d8 defends. Now, how do we attack the d5 pawn again? That's right, queen to b3. So now there are three attackers on that pawn. Queen to e7 is played by Anderson. And it may look like that Morphe could take on d5 here. The problem is that that actually would be a blunder because of queen to d6, taking advantage of the, the pin of the knight. Uh, Morphe could save the piece with queen to b4, but after queen takes, knight takes, rook takes, hitting the knight, knight goes to c2, rook to d2. Um, black is much better here. He has a better minor piece. Um, he's got pressure on the knight. He's got an extra pawn. And his king being at f8 becomes an advantage because it's closer to the center in an endgame. So uh, Morphe's not going to allow that. So the pawn cannot yet be captured. Uh, but instead he plays rook a to e1. Now the, there's threats uh, to capture. And um, Anderson plays really a, a, a shocking move when you first see it. g5. That's sort of a modern... <laughs> you wouldn't be surprised to see Stockfish or a, a neural network computer from the modern era play a move like that. Um, but better probably would have been g6, although after this, knight to e2 with the knight coming into f4, piling up on the bishop at e6 would be an issue. Um, simply queen to d6, stepping out of the pin on the e-file was probably the best move. Um, but after g5, Morphe could have played knight to e2. That may have been the strongest. The idea is the knight could come to g3 and either go maybe to f5, but also to h5. A knight on h5 would control g7 and basically ruin the whole point of g5 and keep that king hemmed in on the back rank. Uh, but instead, Morphe plays the move queen to d1, also a good move. Uh, moves like queen to c1 piling up on g5 are possible. So Anderson steps out of the pin with queen to f6. And we've been talking about how there's been threat after threat after threat, and anyone dealing with a long series of threats is apt to eventually make a misstep. And with this next move, Morphe sets a very devious trap. The move he plays is rook 1 to e3. Now, the best move here for black is probably rook to d6, and we'll see why in a second. But can you see what Morphe's trap is after rook 1 to e3? Well, Anderson did not see it, and he allowed it. He played rook to g8. I'll give you a second to see what the best move is for white. Okay, now I'm going to reveal the solution. Morphe plays rook takes bishop, and in this position, Anderson resigned. Why? Well, after retaking the rook, because he played rook 1 to e3, he can now play rook to f3, pinning the queen to the king. Now, this game just shows how far ahead of his contemporaries Morphe was, and also the value of always threatening something on every move if you possibly can. Now, even after going over this great game uh, by Paul Morphy, there are still some great chess you're missing out on. To fix that problem, believe it or not, the key game you want to see is going to be in this video right here. So be sure to check that out for some really mind-blowing chess. See you again soon at Chess Dog. Goodbye.